We like the stock. We like the stock. We like the stock. We like the stock. Seeing what GameStop has become, it's strange to reflect on its humble beginnings way back in 2020. Back then, GameStop wasn't a stock market juggernaut or a license to print free money. It was a relic from another era. Operating over 5,500 stores in the US alone, GameStop was struggling due to its painfully outdated business model of existing in the real world. E-commerce expert George Sherman was brought on as CEO to transform this brick-and-mortar disc flogger into a digital power player. But with COVID-19 digging into profits and opening hours, GameStop decided to get a little creative when assigning their employees overtime, literally making them dance for it on TikTok. Not ideal. But at least GameStop were trying to keep their employees in work, unlike the people betting against them. Hedge funds like Melvin Capital saw what they saw as GameStop's inevitable decline and decided to short the company's stock, essentially betting against the company's continued survival. It seemed like a sure thing, an obvious call. So obvious that dozens of other hedge funds had the same idea. By April 15th, 91% of all GME stock was sold short, and it would be sitting ugly at over 140% later that year, meaning these hedge funds were actually shorting more shares of GameStop than actually existed. An absurd, highly publicized position which would make it a perfect target for a short squeeze. You've probably heard of short selling thanks to Christian Bale's character in The Big Short, Michael Burry, who famously shorted the American housing market in the lead up to the 2008 financial fuckity doodah. The real Michael Burry though, the one what the Christian Bale one was based off of, was sick of all these copycat hedge funds stealing his signature move. Burry, though, was buying GME before it was cool. If we look at his company's quarter-free finances for 2020, we see that he was holding over 2 million shares of GME, betting against the other hedge firms and their certainty in GameStop's demise. It turns out that a short squeeze isn't something you do when you're mildly constipated. It's a stock market anomaly that occurs when a heavily shorted company suddenly shoots up in value, usually due to some unexpected good press. This is one what happened to Volkswagen, where the ailing automotive manufacturer briefly became the most valuable company in the world one Tuesday in 2008. The skyscraper trajectory of the stock is caused by a sort of financial feedback loop, where the initial bump in price forces traders who have shorted the stock to buy it back to avoid further losses. This increases the price yet again, which pushes it on to other short sellers who are forced to buy it back as well, and then this process just continues and continues until the graph goes all pointy. But not Batman over here wasn't the only one who observed this potential. After all, the information was available to anyone with a dial-up connection. And with everyone working, or in fact not working from home, people had more time to surf Reddit looking for ways to make free money. Yo, what up everybody? This cool cat is Roaring Kitty, but on Reddit he is better known as Deep Fucking Value, a high profile games poster on Wall Street Bets. A glorious community made up of folks who like to use naughty no no words and post videos of themselves losing several thousand dollars. <laughs> But some of these guys are really, really smart. And Roaring Kitty ain't just a street fighting man, neither. He's a chartered financial analyst. These guys getting in early knew exactly what they were doing. GameStop is one of the most compelling asymmetric opportunities in the market today. Really, I don't understand how you could disagree with that. That's why it's the top position in my portfolio and also Dr. Mike Berry's portfolio. Over the next six months, GameStop's fortunes went from fucked to what the fuck is happening. And I think it should be pointed out that this couldn't have happened if GameStop wasn't also a perfect mascot for its audience. You know, people who like to record sea shanties about their favourite stocks. <gasps> Soon may the Tendy Man come to send a rocket into the sun. One day when the trading is done, we'll take our gains and go. And many of these Reddit-bound retail investors were using Robin Hood. We are all investors. Who sold people on buying and selling stock by making it look like a free-to-play video game, but with some, you know, fairly significant in-game purchases, i.e. 
real stock. With this ease of access, rabid enthusiasm, and everyone sat at home probably sans trousers, it was only a matter of time before the short sellers felt the squeeze. I think GameStop's price has been rising steadily since the 12th of January. On the 21st, it closes at $43 a share. The stock has more than doubled in value in just one week. For context, Apple has taken over a year to achieve that kind of growth. And the hedge funds can already hear the sound of the streamers, with Andrew left at Citron Capital looking fucking shook! I have no problem selling the stock higher. You're not going to change the story. You're not going to change the underlying fundamentals of this company. Therefore, as long as the borrow is available and insiders are still selling uh, and the company needs money, you won't see a squeeze from here on in. Anyone with a few brain cells who had visited Wall Street bets over the last few months knew that this was evidence that the short squeeze was working. The subreddit itself fosters its own kind of feedback loop, one made of pressured positivity and, uh, memes. Their dream was for GameStop to become the most valuable company in the world. And with that day's trading as evidence, it actually seemed like a possibility. I'd been following the story for a little bit by then, and full disclosure, that's where I got in at $152 a share. I thought, what better way to keep myself invested than being invested? And in these isolated times, it's nice to feel part of something even if that something sort of kind of resembles mass hysterical market manipulation. But as CNBC's Jim Cramer pointed out, that's not what this was. Because of the very First different. Amendment. Very, no, very, no, very, listen very to different. me. It's First Amendment protection versus the idea of a group getting together to bust the shorts. But if the group is not a real group, it's just a lot of people who love it, it's going to be very hard for the U.S. attorney to do anything, Herb. <laughs> About two hours later, it looked like I bought in right at the peak of the market. For the rest of the day, I was losing money. Uh, every time I looked at the graph, I felt like one of those suckers who queue up to take a photo at the top of Everest. But hey, it's my first day. It's not like anyone can see this shit coming. All right, all right, look, I was up all night, but it's fine. I don't need that much sleep and I am already on the coke. I've been checking out the chatter on Discord, and I'm just trying to figure out what the next play is. It's either AMC, BlackBerry, or Nokia. BlackBerry has strong meme potential, whereas AMC has the nostalgia factor. It's also pretty heavily shorted at 88%, which is still far below GameStop's 144%, but it's something. And then this guy in my Discord chat made a very persuasive case for AMC with this picture from the moon. Bruh. I'm thinking about putting GME on a limit order, and I'm pretty bearish on BlackBerry. I've only just learnt what all these terms mean, but I'm prepared to call anyone a paper-handed loser for not understanding what I didn't 10 hours ago! GME opens at $88 after closing at $78, and from there it nearly doubles. Reports circulate that Melvin Capital is burning through cash, but is being kept afloat by other firms. When the market closes, GME is sitting comfortably at $148 a share. I'm nearly making money, baby! I knew I was a good, um... Day trader. Meanwhile, CNBC was struggling to find anyone with the relevant meme expertise. There's 20,000 people live in a Discord who are spamming, you know, rocket emojis, yelling, go to the moon. Even Jim Cramer just wanted everyone to calm down, which is funny coming from someone who looks like he's one blood cell away from an aneurysm. At the end of the day, I don't think a Reddit forum can bring the house down. They're picking undervalued stocks, bet a big short position, and run away with them. And that can cause crazy moves in a handful of stocks, but it's not big enough to move the entire market. Come on! And just 10 minutes after the markets did close, the world's richest Redditor tweeted this. Dumping rocket fuel on the same short sellers who nearly bankrupted his own company three years ago. And that's when I realized I wasn't in this for the money. This was a revenge mission. A holy crusade against the same baddies from the 2008 financial fuckity... Uh-oh. It was a sequel. Wall Street 2, Money Never Sleep. Oh. Ah, they already made that one. AMC wipes out its entire pandemic plunge as its share price triples pre market. Me and everyone else on the internet is now committed to this ideological war against the bourgeois financial elites, whoever they are. 
but I'm not trying to get carried away here. Anyway, I buy six shares of AMC for good measure. GME has been surging too, and it's projected to open at way over $200. Meanwhile, it looks like Melvin Capital were hurting, with the news announcing that they were closing all of their short positions. This turned out to be a fucking lie. They did take a loss. Uh... They may not put them out of business, but uh, boy did they come close. And over at Citroen Capital, Andrew Left didn't know if he was Andrew Left or Andrew Right. So the reason I'm doing this video is because I cannot answer one more phone call. How are you? Are you okay? Are you in business? What about GameStop? These tech head teenagers were occupying Wall Street's profits and making money while they did it. Whereas Occupy Wall Street occupied the sidewalk and made a bucket drum band. The US 500, 250 and small caps are all down. People are selling across the market, either because they are anticipating volatility or because they're YOLOing their retirement portfolio straight into GME, baby. Yeah, we're retiring on Pluto, bitch! The market opens, and this is the part where the graph gets really pointy. The day goes on, and the gains are out of control. And that's when I realize I might actually make some money on this thing. So naturally, at this point, I decided to sell everything I had, like the weasel that I am. But I'm not just a weasel, I am also a cheapskate who bought all of his stocks on an app with fractional shares. So when I try to sell off my position, the app crashes. Clearly, I wasn't the only one who had the idea. The price peaks at $380, before careening back down like a bowling ball through candy floss. Robinhood and other digital exchanges suffer from a litany of issues thanks to all the traffic on their apps. I go to complain on the Wall Street Bets Discord, but it's been banned for violating hate speech rules. Apparently some of those memes were getting a little spicy. By the time the White House announces that they don't know how to feel about all this yet, but our team is, of course, our economic team, including Secretary Yellen and others, are monitoring uh, the situation. The market has already closed, with GME sitting below $350 a share. Okay, I didn't get much sleep last night either, but it's okay. What I caught between the anxiety-induced awake mares looks pretty promising. The price has been spiking high and low all night pre-market, and it's starting to get pretty close to my original thesis that there is no way that this thing can go above 420 bucks. I know these people, and I know when they see that number on their phone, they will not be able to help themselves. It's the one time where it's funnier to sell than it is to buy. When the market opens, GME soars again. But as I watch the stocks go up and up, I find it harder and harder to sell. What if I'm missing out on a good thing? So I don't sell. I figure, if it happened yesterday, why won't it happen tomorrow? It's not like this is a once in a decade event or anything like that. And the hedge funds still have plenty of cash still to bleed. I'm telling you, this stock only goes up. Then Robinhood ceases trading GME and associated stocks on their app. That's bad. But then CNBC says the other hedge funds are doomed. That's good. GME reaches its all-time high of $483. And then comes crashing straight back down. I think some 420 limit orders may have had something to do with this, but that is pure speculation. Then TD Ameritrade ceases selling GM too. I don't even know what that is and I know it's bad. And then on Twitter, I read this. Race to who finishes the GME short squeeze internet lore video first? Hell, I reckon folks could short squeeze the views until then. As you can imagine, I was feeling the heat. When Robinhood announces that they are only allowing their customers to sell their meme stocks, people are pissed, and the market closes with GME at $193. And yeah, I still didn't sell. I can tell you're judging me. But look, there was never a better time to hold GME at least in the eyes of all the normies on Twitter. I basically think there are two kinds of people on the internet. People who want money, and people who want attention. And this was something they could all agree on. Well, everyone other than Jimmy Kimmel for some reason. Over the past six months, their stock price has grown by 8,000%. Because a bunch of amateur investors, maybe even some Russian disruptors... With the price diving, headline writers jostled for who could call the inevitable decline first. As class action lawsuits were prepared for Robin Hood, it looked like the cards were being stacked against retail investors. And yet, I was still in. How was I going to get all those gains back anyway? Investing in real stocks? Pfft, I could take years! Was prepared to go down with the ship? Yep, same. Five biceps. I knew the risks going in. Five diamonds. With everyone on the internet, myself included, patting ourselves on the back for taking the fight to the bankers, we did have some help. 
from all the other bankers. Wall Street bets might have landed the first punch, but this wasn't a boxing match, it was a feeding frenzy. Once all the other hedge funds scented blood, they were making money up and down the pointy bit of the graph. Okay, I'm reading that AMC's pre-market traffic is really heavy, and um... Well, to be honest with you, I've started losing interest. Also, whenever I close my eyes, I see graphs. With everyone sitting in their pants waiting for the market to open, they've started shilling crypto instead. Chief among them is Elon Musk, who changes his Twitter bio to Bitcoin, sending the price shooting up 17%. And then Dogecoin jumps up from a dip, just like I joked it would two days ago on Twitter. And that's when I realized that the richest man in the world and me have something in common. We're both sat at home completely wasting our fucking time. I'm not a stock market majigger. I'm a YouTuber guy. Maybe a comic book writer, but that's a whole other thing. If I've learned anything in my five days as a day trader, it's this. Buy low, mm. sell high, invest in EV, whatever that is, and uh, you know, you've got to diversify and uh, You know what? I'm not leaving. I'm not fucking leaving! GME is my home! Diamond hand, bitch! I'm never selling! I don't give a fuck what happens! If you want these diamond hands, you're gonna have to cut them off with some diamond cutting lasers or some shit. I don't know, but never leaving. GME forever. Peace out. I low, sell high. That's what I always say. Yeah, well, that's the kind of elbow turn your broker wouldn't pay you for. But if we're not eating Cheetos straight from the cash register, then Q1 is all sauce, no gravy, right down to Central Station, if you know what I'm saying. I'm gonna drink two whole Red Bulls.